following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The sacrament of extreme unction is the final of the primary sacraments of the Gnostic Church. And in that sense, it is the culmination of the previous sacraments. It's the sacrament that is built upon all of the previous sacraments or sacred rituals, sacred acts. To understand what extreme unction is and means in its true application, in the esoteric sense, in the depth, we have to recall the very purpose of Gnosis, or in Hebrew, da'at, knowledge, which is this hidden sephira, this hidden sephiroth, this sphere in the central column of the tree of life. The knowledge or the gnosis that is being given to humanity in these moments is being given with a specific purpose which differs from the knowledge, the gnosis that has been given in all the previous centuries. And this is because humanity is dying. When we observe humanity with the eye of a physician, when we step back from our attachments and our personality and our grievances, and we observe humanity scientifically, as if we were extraterrestrials or a doctor observing a patient, we would see that humanity as an entire organism, if humanity were one body, that this body is critically ill. The symptoms of this illness are visible all over this imaginary body. We see a proliferation of suffering, of such diversity and pervasiveness that it boggles the mind. We see a body laid on our examination table 
that suffers a severe cancer. <clears throat> if you know something about medical science, you know that cancer classically, commonly, is considered to be a, a class of disease in which the cells display a very unusual characteristic, which is to have uncontrolled growth. And the disposition to invade other parts of the body, to invade and destroy. When we understand the nature of cancer in a physical body and we observe its characteristics, we can see that that same set of characteristics has infected the psyche of humanity. The psyche of humanity is suffering from a psychological cancer. This psychological cancer is evident throughout every country and city and community on this planet. This cancer is marked predominantly by the same characteristics as a physical cancer, uncontrolled growth and the predisposition to invade, to conquer, violence. In other words, the organism of humanity is killing itself. And we see this everywhere. Wars without end. Wars without clear reason. Wars where there is no threat. Wars over words. Wars over money. People killing just for the fun of killing. And we see this psychological predisposition being stuffed down the throats of our children through television, through games, through books, through the internet, through movies, where our children now are most primarily entertained by violence. All of us, adults and children, are now entertained by watching how to kill, by being entertained through killing, through violence. Not just violence physically, but also violence emotionally and mentally through sarcasm, through cruelty in humor, through cruelty in speech. The illness that humanity is suffering from has symptoms visible in every sphere of our existence. Every system that is necessary to maintain our health and life is breaking down. Our social systems, which are based in marriage and the unity of a family, are fracturing at ever greater rates as the divorce rates rise and as family stability completely dissolves. Where families now no longer live near one another as they once did, but families are scattered all over the planet. No longer able to maintain the sense of family unity, which is so critical in the development of a child. We see our political, our economic, and our environmental systems all at the point of destruction. We, the human organism, the body of humanity, are committing a form of suicide. And yet, we refuse to recognize that we're sick. Like most people in these times, we suffer ailments and refuse to acknowledge them. And when we do acknowledge a few ailments, we try to blame someone else. Humanity as a whole is suffering a grave illness 
a fatal illness, that humanity persists in the idealism that things are going to get better, that the future is somehow bright, even though objectively, scientifically, there is no evidence for that in a single part of our lives. The main one that we use as evidence for the improvement of life is technology. We believe that because now we have iPods and cell phones, that our technology is making our lives better. What we fail to realize is that the vast majority of our planet's resources are invested into military technology, the science of killing, the vast majority of our wealth, of our energy, of our time, as a humanity, as an entire race, is invested into how to kill. Not only that, but our food supplies are dwindling and becoming poisoned. They're becoming unreliable. Our water supply is at its worst state in our entire history. Fewer people now have access to clean water than ever before. Our air is poisoned. The earth is poisoned. We've built technologies that we don't understand. We've built nuclear weapons that rot in hidden pathways and hidden chambers all over the planet that leach dangerous chemicals into our soil and water. And we ignore this. And worst of all now, the terror of being killed is spreading all over the world. In previous decades, the idea that you could walk out of your house and be killed was only limited to a few specific places on the globe. But now, you can't live anywhere in the world and be free of the fear of being murdered. Now, our children are killing adults. There's no safety anywhere. People who once thought that they were safe in the suburbs or in the country now are terrified to send their children to school. Now live with the very real threat that some person may commit some heinous act of terrorism near them. All of these things and, and many more that we don't have time to discuss are indicative of an illness that is consuming humanity. If we as a doctor were to look at this body lying on the table, and consider the amount of cancer in the body, the amount or the number of people in the world who are actively committing crimes, killing, seeking to steal from others, to manipulate, to lie, to get something for nothing, to take advantage of other people economically or politically or sexually, all of those ways of thinking are cancerous. They're destructive. They care nothing for the whole organism of the body of humanity. They only care for their own desire, their own hunger. <clears throat> if we looked at all of those forms of desire and analyzed them as a cancer, and we looked at all those cancerous elements in the body of humanity, we would see that the body of humanity is nearly entirely consumed with this psychological cancer. And all of us have these elements within. None of us is an exception. All of us have anger, which is a cancer. All of us have pride, which is a cancer. We have lust, we have envy. These are psychological illnesses 
which cause us to harm ourselves and harm other people. We are the cause of the fatal illness that humanity is dying from. There's no one else to blame. It's through our actions, moment to moment, day to day, that have produced the condition within which we find this planet. The pollution, the destruction of our food, the reduction of wealth, the disparities of economic wealth, the lack of social and economic security in the world, terrorism, violence, rape, all of these elements are because of who we as individuals have become, not other people. Every person that exists that lives today bears a portion of the responsibility because we are all part of the same body. We are all connected. No mind is separate from any other mind. We are interdependent. We affect each other. And because of that, we infect each other. The cities on this planet, which are becoming great boils of pestilence on the body of the, of the world, are producing so much despair and pollution and depravity that the planet is quaking under their influence. This is not normal. The state of humanity is not normal. It is a state of illness sickness at the brink of death. I realize that some people in listening to my description of humanity will be offended and feel that this is very negative or very dark. That thought, that idea is the very problem. It's the refusal to look at the facts. The facts are what we need in order to cure an illness. You may believe that you will get better, but you will not get better unless you produce the causes for the cure. The law is the law. Nature functions according to laws, not belief, not good intentions, not idealism, not optimism. Even though my description of humanity sounds dark, it does not lack optimism. If it lacked optimism, why would I bother to even give this lecture? There is a cure. There is a solution to help humanity, to help ourselves. And we find it in the sacrament of extreme unction. The solution is to look into our own mind. This is the purpose of any real gnosis or knowledge, to produce change not to idealize or just play with words and not to be afraid of speaking the truth or to state the facts or to look at the facts. But instead, Gnosis teaches us, look at the facts as they are, not how we want them to be, not how they should be, but as they are. As a doctor, as a physician, this is the only way to treat an illness. You have to see the illness for what it is. The problem with us is that we're so much in love with ourselves, we don't want to see the facts of our own filthiness, of our own responsibility, of our own mistakes. This is why we're in the problem that we're in. As a doctor observing humanity in this way, we have to recognize 
that the pervasive cancer that is destroying the body of humanity is fatal. This body will die. Humanity will die. Everything that exists dies. Every particle that is born will die. Every universe that is born will die. There is no law in nature that states that humanity will continue on forever. The physical humanity, that is. The psychological humanity. There is an element that persists. There is an ex a level of existence that continues. But it is not in these lower densities of nature where we live. That which is eternal is in the very rarefied levels. Very supreme, very subtle. Levels of nirvana and para-nirvana. These things are eternal. And within all of us, we have an element that belongs there. We call this the consciousness, the Buddha nature. If we can learn to develop that part to create what we call a soul, we can then be free of the laws that control the lower densities of nature. We can become immortal, eternal, fully, beyond suffering, beyond pain. But to do that, we have to cure our own illness, cure our own sickness. In the past, humanity has passed through this before. Humanity has become very sick and died. There have been many races on this planet, not just ours. Ours happens to be the Aryan race, which is the race that falls under the jurisdiction of Ares, the planet Mars, who's related with Samael, the great angel of judgment, of justice. But in the past race, which this humanity remembers as Atlantis, humanity also became very sick, very ill with a cancer, psychological cancer. And because of that, the Gnostic Church, in all their efforts to assist that race, realized that the time came when that body was too sick and it was time for that body to die. But because the Gnostic Church is the embodiment of compassion, of love, bodhicitta, they gave the opportunity to any parts of that humanity who were ready to leave, to abandon desire, to abandon violence, to come to know the truth of their own inner divinity, to escape the death of that body, and to be a part of the generation of a new race. Thus the karma of that Atlantean epoch descended upon them, and that body of humanity died. This is remembered in the Bible as the Great Flood. The story of Noah or the Vaivasvata Manu is the great deluge remembered in all the world's traditions, whether you study the Greeks and Deucalion, or you study the Babylonians, or you study the Jews or the Christians. In all of these traditions, we find the great flood. And this great flood is when humanity died, and some pure elements were able to move on and form the seed for a new development, for a new race. In the Bible, it's written in this way. God saw that man's wickedness on earth was increasing. Every impulse of his innermost thought was only for evil. Now, this word evil is the Hebrew word ra. 
which is actually translated more directly, not as evil, but as polluting. And this polluting is not referring to air pollution or water pollution. It's referring to the polluting of the self through sex. This word, ra, refers to the orgasm, to the spilling of semen, which in the Zohar, in the Talmud, in the root of the entire Jewish tradition, is said to be the gravest sin of all. And this is because when the orgasm is experienced, there is energy that is expelled and wasted, which should be used to produce life, to bring new souls. So when that energy is destroyed, all those souls are, in effect, killed, denied, locked out. This is what the rabbis say, according to the Talmud. So in the Bible it says that God saw that humanity was only thinking in that, in sex, in animal fornication. And so God was going to be destroyed, and he was going to send a great flood to cleanse the earth of all of this pollution, lust. And God said to Noah, because Noah was a righteous man, faultless in his generation. Generation refers to engender, to generate, genesis, to create. This is sexual. But it says, Noah walked with God, and Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These, thr these three sons are the three solar bodies, astral, mental, and causal. This is the soul. So the Bible says, the world was corrupt before God, and the land was filled with crime. God saw the world, and it was corrupted. All flesh had perverted its way on the earth. And so, a great flood came, 40 days and 40 nights, which is related with the letter Mem, the, the waters. But these are the bitter waters, the waters of the poison of God, the waters that destroy the ego, the waters that eliminate all impurity. These same waters came when the Buddha was achieving his enlightenment. There was a great flood. The only way the Buddha Shakyamuni survived the great flood was that he was protected by a serpent king named Mukalimba. That serpent king is a Naga, or in other words, represents the Kundalini. And that serpent had seven heads, which relate to the seven bodies of the soul, the lower seven spheres on the tree of life. In the same way, Noah escaped the flood because he was told to build the ark. And the ark comes from arcanum, which means a secret, a mystery. That arcanum is tantra. Through that arcanum, through that secret knowledge of da'at, of gnosis, Noah was able to build the ark and floated upon the waters in the same way that the Buddha did. Thus, the soul, the Buddha nature, the consciousness is saved from destruction. This arcanum is the sacrament of matrimony. It is the sacrament of how to create the soul, spiritual birth. And we've discussed this through the course on the sacraments. Birth or creation is always a combination or a manipulation of energy. When we fornicate or produce the orgasm in the same way that the animals do, the energies of yasad or the sexual force is expelled and in the physical world a creation ensues. But that creation is a manipulation of matter and energy. And in the esoteric science, in every tradition, 
that is always boiled down to four elements. Fire, air, water, and earth. This is deeply symbolic. Scientists nowadays read these scriptures and, te- and treatises literally and so rejected all of this knowledge about the four elements. They didn't understand that this is talking about more subtle levels of nature, but specifically concerned with the four bodies. Four elements, four spheres, four bodies that are required in order for us to become a priest or priestess. In the Zohar, one of the core books of the Hebrew tradition, we find this description. And the Lord God took the man through creation, through Genesis, and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the question may be asked, whence did he take him? The answer is from the four elements, fire, air, earth, and water, which form the basis of man's physical body and are symbolized by the words, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became four heads. These four elements we've discussed throughout the course. These are Aleph, Shin, and Mem. Aleph is the air. Shin is the fire. Mem is the water. And the letter Nun condenses all those elements into the earth. The first three are the mother letters. And the Nun is the sun. The nun, that letter nun, symbolizes the fish. And it's within the sexual seed, here in the earth, in the physical body. But these four elements, these four letters, also symbolize the first, the lowest four spheres on the tree of life. Malkut is the earth. Macrocosmically, it's the planet earth. But microcosmically, it's our physical body. This is Nun. Yasod is the fourth dimension, Eden. But in relation to us and our soul, it's the vital body, the energetic body. This is related with water, the waters of Mem, the sexual water. Hod is related to the astral body, to fire, to Shin. And Netzah is the mental body, related to the air or aleph. So these four elements, these four bodies, when fallen into sin, are called the four bodies of sin. Because it's through the physical body that we commit acts, that we use our energies of yasad in the wrong way. We think or we think and feel through hod and netza. Hod is the astral body related with emotion. And through the physical body, we abuse that. Netza is the mental body where we think and we experience that through the physical body. But in each of these cases, it's through our three brains. Our intellectual brain, the physical brain, is the vehicle of the intellectual brain, which in turn is the vehicle of the mental body. We're talking about levels of subtlety in matter and energy. This is important to understand, though. The astral body, or the body of desires, the Kama Rupa, processes itself through our heart, and we feel it in the emotional center. And lastly, the vital body in Yasod, related to Yasod, we experience through our motor, sexual, and instinctual brain. Energy, specifically sex. We sin through these four psychological vehicles. In other words, we commit mistakes. We have our anger, our pride, our lust, our envy, and they process through these regions, these psychological aspects. It's because of that that we've become the fallen Adam or the sinning Adam and have been cast out of Eden. We suffer. Eden means bliss, ecstasy. We don't have that. We don't live in ecstasy, in bliss. We live in suffering. We don't live in Eden. Eden is bliss, ecstasy. 
We live in suffering. We live in hell. We're trying to make the best of it, but in reality, it's getting worse every day. It's getting harder. People who are a little older know this with, for a fact because they see in their lifetime how much things have changed and gotten worse and continue to get worse. And it's terrifying. Terrifying. Especially if you have children. You wonder what's going to happen with them. The Zohar continues about these four elements. The Holy One formed man from these four elements and placed him in the Garden of Eden. This is back in the beginning, before sin. Into which a man enters again whenever he repents of his wrongdoing and conforms his life to the good law, the Dharma, until at length, divested of morality, of mortality, he is placed again in the heavenly garden. That is, he enters into and becomes a conscious participant of the divine life and clothed with immortality. To dress it and keep it, the garden, means to keep and observe all the precepts of the good law, the Dharma, obedience to which imparts to and endows him with power to control the four elements and drink of the river of the water of life. Disobedience causes him to drink of the bitter waters flowing from and by the tree of evil, Ra, fornication, symbolizing the tempter, Lucifer, so that instead of ruling and controlling the elements, he becomes their slave. Then what occurs is written concerning the children of Israel when they came to the waters of Marah. They could not drink of the waters, for they were bitter. Disobedience to the good law of right doing always, sooner or later, results in bitterness of life, thought, and feeling. And only by right doing can the words of Scripture be accomplished. This is all from the Zohar. Perhaps you're seeing why all the sacraments are necessary in order to understand this one. There's great depth in that short passage. In synthesis, when we learn to be psychologically in harmony with the law, the Dharma, which descends from the Gnostic Church, from Baat, naturally, our soul, our psyche, enters Eden, becomes blissful, because we're not breaking any of the laws of nature. We then drink of the waters of life, pure water which is sustaining, it's nourishing. When we break that law, the dharmic law, then we, those waters become bitter, which is called in Hebrew, Mara, which is interesting because in Buddhism, the one who tempts the Buddha is Mara. This is no accident. In order for us to stop drinking the bitter waters, we need to abide by the law. There's another example very similar to this in the Bible related to Moses. When Moses led the Egyptians out of Egypt, Moses represents the human soul, the Bodhisattva. His name means born of water and fire. Born again, in other words. And he's related specifically with Tifereth, the human soul. And you see that Tifereth is above the four bodies of sin. Tifereth, our conscience, our human soul, can guide us out of bondage, slavery. When we become enslaved by the four elements. Remember it stated that here. When we drink the bitter waters, we become enslaved by the four elements. These four elements are related to these four bodies of sin. Of sin. We become enslaved because of desire. The main desires are for sex and money. These are the main ones that have enslaved humanity. Sex and money. Most people, all they think about all day 
is one of the two. Either sex or money, or sometimes both. It's this enslavement that produces suffering. So in the book of Exodus, God leads the Egyptians through Moses out of Egypt. But the Egyptians pursue the congregation, the Israelites. The Egyptians symbolize the ego itself. All of those elements that are identified with desire. So by virtue of his priesthood, the magic of the priesthood, Moses, as a vehicle of God, as Vav, leads the Egyptians to cross the water as though it were dry land. Just like when Jesus walked across the waters. They cross the Red Sea. The Israelites do. Jesus also crossed the water. So after they do this, they get to the other side. Then the, the waters of that sea kill the Egyptians. This is an important thing to grasp. Remember, the waters have this essential duality. They can be bitter or sweet. It depends upon our own psychological relationship with the water. The water in us is in Yasad. This is Mayim. This is the water we need to bring Shin into to make it Shamayim, heaven. Shin is Christ, fire. When we're able to do that, we drink of that water and are nourished by it. The soul is nourished, but the ego is poisoned. This is a very subtle, important point. Anyone who's been studying Gnosis for a little while, especially practicing Gnosis, knows the fact of this. When you take these teachings seriously, you put them into practice, you begin to actualize them, you experience this. Moments when your consciousness feels forms of bliss and happiness and joy and peace that are indescribable, totally new, beautiful, inspiring. But you also experience the bitterness of the ego as your own transmutation begins to make that ego suffer. And we face ordeals and problems and challenges. And then we find ourselves in that conflict. Sometimes simultaneously experiencing both states. Bliss consciously, pain in the ego at the same time. This can be scary, confusing. But the answer is here in the book of Exodus. After they left the Red Sea... Moses led Israel onward. They went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he, Moses, cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And Moses cast the tree into the waters, and the waters were made sweet. That tree is the tree of knowledge. Dot, gnosis. When we transmute the sexual force, we work directly with the tree of knowledge, Dat, the Gnostic church. We are provided with a healing balm which heals the consciousness, which nourishes and sustains us, even when all the other waters are bitter. And that's why after this, Moses says, or the Lord says to them, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do all that which is right in his eyes, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep his statutes, his law, I will put none of the diseases upon thee, which I have put upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. 
The healing comes from Christ. From above. Moses acts as the intermediary. The vessel or vehicle that delivers the healing balm. But Moses in ourselves represents the human soul that we have to develop. That development comes through matrimony, through marriage. Moses, as the human soul in the story, represents a bodhisattva, someone who has taken the direct path, the bodhisattva path. This is distinct from the nirvanic path, from the shravakiana or the mahayana. Bodhisattva path, specifically in this case, is tantrayana, mantrayana. This is the highest yoga tantra. It's important to understand the distinction. As such, Moses here, whose name is Moshe, Mem Shen He, represents how we are born again through Tantra. And that spiritual birth is the creation of the soul, where we create the solar bodies. We raise the serpent of the Kundalini throughout these lower spheres and awaken consciousness, creating new vessels, new vehicles from those four elements. These new vehicles have nothing to do with the ones we have now. They're different. They're pure because they're not made from fornication. In the Bible, these are called the four holy creatures, the four hayot. In the book of Ezekiel, you can also see them. This creation that occurs is written in the Zohar when it says, Blessed is he whose study is in the secret doctrine. For when the Holy One takes his soul unto himself, Tiferet, it leaves the body formed out of the four elements behind. And rising on high is placed at the head of the four hayot, or living creatures to whom the words refer, in their hands shall they bear thee up. The four holy creatures are the solar bodies that we need, rooted in the causal body. They also represent the four lower bodies, which are the bull, the man, the lion, and the eagle, which are the physical, the vital, the astral, and mental bodies. The important thing for us to grasp here is that this creation occurs only from the sweet water through transmutation. So about the passage that I read from Moses throwing the tree into the water, the Zohar says this, And the Lord showed him a tree, which when he cast into the waters, the waters, though bitter, were made sweet. The tree here spoken of is the tree of life, in the midst of which is the tree of knowledge, and the divine or higher life. And if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do all that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought unto the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. What does all this mean, says the Zohar? What is the secret doctrine or teaching inculcated in these words? It is that when this, our human life, becomes dark and embittered with sorrow and sadness through weakness and failing to live in accordance with the good law, there is only one agent or power that can clarify it and cause it to become again pure and sweet and clear, and it is the divine within us. Healing all our diseases, redeeming from all evil, and satisfying with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagle's. It was through the instrumentality of Moses that the waters at Mara were made sweet, and he therefore represents the Messiah. This is the Zohar. Moses and Messiah in Hebrew are nearly identical. Moses represents the Messiah because, in this case, he's representing the Bodhisattva, the human soul 
who's entering the direct path. And in that entrance, he is receiving Christ within himself, the Savior. This is the power to heal. It comes from Christ. The word unction means a balm, medicine, an ointment. But this sacrament is not concerned with a common unction. It's called extreme unction. This comes from unction in extremis, which means a balm or ointment given in an extreme case. We are in an extreme case. As much as our media and our politicians and our spiritual leaders want us to believe that everything's going to be just great, we all know very well the terror, the fear, the uncertainty that we feel. We sense it. This is why there's so much interest in prophecies, in understanding what's going to happen. Nostradamus, the book of Revelation. Because those things will happen. They're coming. This humanity will die. This planet will die. We have a choice to make. Do we receive the unction in extremis from the Christ through the consciousness or through the ego? In the Gospels, the apostles receive this power of healing. And so it says in the book of Mark, and they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. These are related. These are not separate things. These three things are extreme unction. Casting out devils refers to our ego, to our desires, to our lust, to our envy. The anointing with oil refers to transmutation. And the healing comes from God. In the book of James, about unction, extreme unction, it says this, Is any man sick among you? Let him bring in the priest of the church. In parentheses, not the doctor, the priest. And let them pray over him, anointing with him, him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick man. And the Lord shall raise him up, and if he be in sins, they shall be forgiven him. So the role of the priest, even in modern or contemporary churches, is to be a healer, to be a doctor, to be a physician, to heal and cast out devils. The role of the priest is not to make everyone feel better temporarily. It is to make everyone feel better for good. And sometimes in the beginning, it's painful. Medicine is bitter. Have you ever noticed that? Not, re- not, not the syrupy, sugary medicine that everybody wants now, but real medicine is bitter. Gnosis tastes bitter because it's bitter to our ego, but it tastes sweet to the soul. This really emphasizes part of the beauty of the name of Samael. That name means the bitter beverage of God. Not the bitter beverage by itself. Not just poison, which is what people usually say. It's Samael. El means of God, from God. This is not a devil or a demon. This is the bitter beverage that God gives to heal. This is medicine. Gnosis is medicine for the soul, but poison for the ego. So in the Catholic tradition, extreme unction is also called last rites. And as you have probably heard, this is a form of blessing that's given at death. And it's given with supposedly the idea of of forgiving or remitting sins.
the Gnostic priest also performs extreme unction in many ways. The first and most important way is by teaching. The main medicine that humanity needs now is knowledge. Humanity, unfortunately, including you and me, we love ignorance. We all say ignorance is bliss. We prefer not to know the truth. We prefer just to continue on our little quiet life and try to stay out of trouble and fill our desires and go shopping and buy things and hopefully get by. We don't want to see the big picture. We don't want to see our role in it. We don't want to see how all the things that we go and buy have a direct impact on the economy, the well-being of people on the other side of the planet. We don't want to see that, but it does. We don't want to see that all the clothes we wear, all the food we eat, all the things we buy came through this vast system of economy that has a lot of problems. We don't want to see the truth of what's in our food, what's in our water, what's in our air. And we don't want to see how we contributed to that and how we contribute to it every day. The Gnostic priest seeks to heal the illness of humanity, not by treating the symptom the way most medicine does in these times. We get a cough, we take a suppressant. We get a pain, we take a painkiller. We don't want to know what the cause is. We just think, oh, I'll just get better. We prefer to avoid the truth. Let me tell you, the graveyards are filled with people who thought they were going to get better. To take Gnosis seriously means you have to see your own willingness to be ignorant. And you have to change that. That takes a lot of courage. We all fool ourselves more than anyone else fools us. There are a lot of people who come to these studies from these groups that are talking about conspiracies and Illuminati and Zionism and the World Bank and all these other things. And they come in thinking, they did this to us. They did it to me. We produce the worst ignorance in ourselves. We produce the conspiracy in ourselves. So the Gnostic doctor seeks to solve the problem by looking at the four bodies of sin. What we see physically are just the symptoms of what exists internally. Our spiritual poverty has produced our economic poverty. Our mental fascination with violence has produced the physical violence. All the so-called experts say there's no relationship between violent movies and TV and video games and violence committed in the physical world. They have no proof of that. And all of us know in our heart that they're wrong. We all know it. But the expert says, oh, there's no relationship. Kids watch violent movies and play violent video games, but it doesn't make them go and kill other people. We all know better. Every one of us. We have to look psychologically for the causes of the disease that's killing humanity. And those psychological causes are inside of us. We need to know about these four bodies. We need to know about ourselves. We do that through practicing this teaching through awakening the consciousness, through performing all the sacraments in ourselves, including the sacrament of priesthood. This doesn't mean that we necessarily become a priest in the physical world, because you remember, the priest is the human soul. You have a human soul. That human soul needs to become a priest inside of you, not necessarily in the physical world. And the one who performs magic, who performs the healing, in, is inside of you, not the priest at your school or your church. 
we all need to enter the sacrament of priesthood and then come to this sacrament of extreme unction. And first, we perform it for ourselves. We first perform extreme unction for our own death, psychological death, our own psychological, mystical death. The way that we do that is we learn very deeply about our own mind by walking through the path of initiation. This path is these first seven spheres on the tree of life, and it begins here and now, in the physical body, awakening consciousness, transforming our energy, working hard. This is not easy. It does not happen automatically. It is not given for free. We have to earn it. This is only possible through marriage. As a single person, you can prepare, as we stated in the other lectures. You can do a lot of preparation. This is a very valuable, important time. But to enter into initiation, to create the solar bodies, requires a matrimony. And this truth is hidden in the Hebrew word for marriage. The word, there are two words really used in Hebrew for marriage. Kiddushin and Nisuim. Kiddushin is the one most people talk about. But really, this means betrothal. It's the period before married life begins. Nonetheless, Kiddushin means sanctified. From sacrament, from sanctity, from purity. When a couple is actually married, in other words, they've performed the sexual act, which incidentally is part of the law of the Talmud. That is the marker of marriage, is sex. It doesn't require any document. It doesn't require even a priest or a rabbi to be there to bless the marriage. Once you've had sex, you're married, according to the Talmud. The other word is nisuim. And this word means or it comes from a root that means elevation. To elevate, to rise. And you remember that we talk about those four holy creatures who will raise us to heaven. These are the solar bodies. So the very word for marriage says elevation. This is the way to rise to God. is through a matrimony. But when you look more deeply into the word... You see that it's written nun, nun, yod, shin, vav, aleph, yod, and mem. We've talked about these letters throughout the course. The first letter is nun. Nun symbolizes the seed, the sexual energy, the fish, the earth. So let's break this down. In the very center of the word is the letter Vav, the human soul, Tiferet, the solar causal body. On either side are two pairs of three letters. At the beginning of the word is Nun Yod Shin, Nun is related to earth, physical body. Shin is related to fire, astral body. On the other side of the Vav, we have Aleph and Mem. Aleph is related to air, mental body. Mem is related to water, vital body. There are the four holy creatures that we create through marriage. Between those bodies on either side are two yods. And who else is that but man and wife, husband and wife? The yod represents a person, a dot, so small. And that's us. Marriage is the union of two souls. 
And through that union, by the intercession of the human soul, the priest, the vav, the spine, the four holy creatures, the solar bodies can be made. This is how Moses becomes the Messiah. Our own human soul becomes a priest. These solar vessels, solar vehicles, give us powers, capacities that are different from what we experience now. A single person can work very hard to eliminate their ego and transform their sexual force and awaken their consciousness. And they can develop capacities in the consciousness which are useful and beautiful. But the married couple who creates the soul works in an entirely new octave, in a series of octaves, creating internal bodies that exist in these other levels of existence. The solar astral body belongs in the astral world. It is a vessel made from gold. And when that vessel is there, we then have power in the astral plane, in the astral world. We have the ability to work directly on the emotion to heal ourselves and others. When we have created the mental body, this is a body of gold that has power in the mental world and can be used to heal the mind of ourselves or others. This is why these bodies are so important. It's not just to play games, to just go into other dimensions and check out stuff because it's cool. It's because our inner priest needs us to heal ourselves first and then help our brothers and sisters who are dying. That's why we have a triangle of priesthood. In the sacrament of priesthood, we learned about Yasod and Hod. The Yasod, the ninth sphere, is the priesthood of sex, sexual magic, Tantra. And this is, of course, in the Mayim, the waters, where we learn to elaborate. Shin, Christ, because of Nun, the fish. We also heard about the priesthood of Hod related to the astral plane. And this is, in other traditions, called natural magic or ceremonial magic or ritual magic. This is concerned with emotion and is specifically related with second chamber and third chamber. Second chamber more. But we have a third form of priesthood, which is hermetic magic, related to the mind in Netzach. This is another level of magic. So these three spheres, Netzach, Hod, and Yasod, are called the triangle of priesthood, or the triangle of magic. Magic comes from magi, priest. To repeat, the purpose of the magic or priesthood is not to gain power, to show off, to play games, to dominate other people, or to fill one's desires. These are not magic. These are Goetia. Black magic. Real magic, white magic, is always performed in accordance with the law, in accordance with the will of our inner God, and always for the benefit of others first. 
This is the difference. This is super important. Most of the time when we come into these kinds of studies, the Master Samael says, the first thing we want is to dominate the minds of others. Sometimes it's just to say, hey, this is so cool, you've got to check out Gnosis. You want to tell everybody about it. And if they don't like it, you get upset. That's because you have a desire for them to follow you. To dominate them to do what you want them to do. That will or desire to dominate others to serve your interests is not good. So the magic of priesthood is how the priest, Moses, our human soul, raises the fire of the Holy Spirit through these bodies. Specifically, these bodies related to the magic of priesthood, the triangle of priesthood. And that kundalini, that power of the Holy Spirit, is what illuminates those inner bodies and gives the priest the power to perform what we would call miracles. This is a power over the four elements. This is the power of the priest, our human soul, over the four elements. The four bodies, the four worlds, or the four spheres below the priesthood, below Tifereth. This is why in all the ancient traditions, we always see miracles related with the elements. Water, fire, air, earth. It's symbolic. So through the process of creating the solar bodies, the pinnacle is in Netzach, the mind. And this is related to those temptations that Jesus faced when he went to the wilderness. And the devil took him up to the pinnacle of the temple, the church, and said, throw yourself and let your angels catch you. Jesus didn't fall into this temptation, but Simon the magician did. Remember the story of Simon? To show himself, to show what a great master he was, to convince others of his mastery and his doctrine, he commanded the elements of the air to bring him up into the air so he could fly. In other words, he failed in that temptation. And then the apostles prayed to Christ. And those forces of the air let go of Simon, and Simon fell to his death. This is in the Bible. But it's symbolic of the temptations and ordeals that we face when we work through the triangle of priesthood. We become tempted to show ourselves to others, to look impressive, to have people admire us or respect us or follow us, things like that. To fly in the air is symbolic of the mind. To show how clever we are, how smart we are, how well we give a lecture, how well we talk about Gnosis, things like this. These are temptations that we face. But the devil says, I will give you all of the kingdoms of the cosmos if you will worship me, our own ego. So many who tread this path do create these bodies and do receive the blessings and powers in these worlds from having these bodies. So they can astral, astral project. They have clairvoyance. They have intuition. They can remember past lives. They can give beautiful doctrine through their lectures and speeches. They can interpret dreams. They have many powers and abilities, but fail in the world of the mind. And these are the most dangerous people that you will encounter. Because they explain the doctrine beautifully, but there will be subtle poison, bitter water, Mara, the tempter, in that doctrine. These are called simoniacs, and we talked about them in the last lecture. For us, who don't have these powers, it becomes very, very difficult to identify who is who. 
who is overcoming temptation and who is falling into it. How does a student find a good teacher? How does a student know who to rely on? The answer is you have to awaken your own consciousness. It's the only way to know. You need to create your own inner priest. And along the way, you will learn who is who. If you stick to the white path. If you don't, then you'll remain in ignorance. The Gnostic priest who has overcome this temptation, who has created the solar causal body and has entered the direct path, receives Christ. To discuss further about that, we have an entire course and many books because it's a very big work, the direct path. But that person, that priest, whether male or female, performs all of their works in these levels, mental, emotional, energetic, and physical. Physical. Everything is done for the benefit of others. They ask nothing for themselves. No praise, no recognition, no followers, no money. They do what they do simply out of love. On the other hand, those who have fallen into temptation have many of the same powers but seek for themselves. And it can be very subtle. The difference between them is difficult for us to see. But if you understand that these levels, Hod and saw specifically, are related with the fifth dimension, and then you understand that the fifth dimension has a superior and an inferior aspect. The superior one is related with the heavens above, which are pure. But the inferior are related with the klipot, with hell, the inferno. So the white magicians who work with Christ work in the superior aspect of the fifth dimension, mental and emotional plane. The black magicians work in the inverted aspect, in hell. The powers look the same from our perspective in the physical world. We hear the stories and they sound the same. We may see manifestations or so-called miracles and they look the same, but their source is different. The problem that exists for us that we need to understand The powers that the black magicians have are very easy to acquire. And you can go to any bookstore right now and find hundreds of books that will teach you how to do it. And they teach practices of meditation, clairvoyance, tantra, pranayama, you name it. And use the same words. They explain the same things, but it has a subtle poison in it. Listen to your heart. Your human soul, your own inner Moses, your own inner Messiah, can guide you, but not if you listen to your reasoning. You have to listen to your heart. That's difficult, because the heart, the emotion, can also confuse us, because our own desires are in the Kama Rupa. The black magicians have power in hell. Hell is none other than the digestive system of nature. Hell is where nature digests and cleanses out what is impure. That's why when this humanity is dying, which is happening now, humanity is entering in surges in waves into the klipoth, 
we had a couple of really big waves with World War I and II, where millions of souls surged into hell, into limbo first, and then gradually out through that digestive tract of the planet, where all those impurities are cleansed and those elements that are pure are purified. The black magicians have power in that level. And unfortunately, the physical world is sinking into it. This is why life is becoming so complicated. This is why in most major cities you walk down the street and it's disgusting and filthy. And the things you see on the street are horrible. That's because it's sinking into the clip off. We need to define ourselves between these two. Inside. We have an ego in us and we have a consciousness in us. And in each moment, we're utilizing energy. Even if we don't have the solar bodies yet, <clears throat> we're utilizing energies through these four bodies in relation with the four elements. Even without the solar bodies, we can produce magic works of priesthood because we have a human soul. But that priesthood can be black or white. It depends on how we use our energy. It's up to us. We need to be very, very careful. Our speech can perform an act of priesthood because there's power in our words. Even our facial expression can totally, dramatically affect someone. And we've all experienced this. This is why in the book of James, it says, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? either of vine, figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge, gnosis, among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom, Christ, Descendeth not from above, but is earthly. I'm sorry, this wisdom of the lower part. Descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in them, in peace of them that make peace. This is how a priest should perform his acts. With humility, with goodness, with mercy, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Never speaking bitterness. And that speech is not just through the words, but through our actions. And also in our mind. By doing that, by learning the, all the sacraments and then entering into the magic through extreme unction to heal ourselves through our action in these levels, we can understand this passage from Exodus. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee by the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Take heed of him and hearken unto his voice. Be not rebellious against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed hearken unto his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. For you shall serve the compassionate one, your God, who will bless your bread and your water. And I shall remove illness from your midst. So extreme unction in ourselves comes through right action by following 
the angel that comes from the Gnostic church. And this way, we learn how to perform extreme unction. To close the lecture, I'll read to you another passage which pulls together the entire course. And I invite you to listen with your intuition to hear the deep meanings that are hidden inside of this passage. This is from the book of Revelation, chapter 22. And he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then he saith unto me, See thou, do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is of thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Any questions? That's right. The scripture says very clearly that the angel that is sent by God to provide the doctrine and to give the help through the sacraments and through the extreme unction, if we reject that help and do not follow the guidance of that angel, that angel becomes our punisher. This is what's written in the book of Revelation. It's the angels of God who descend to exercise the judgment of God. And this is why we know and explain that Klepoth itself was instituted by God. 
that the suffering that the soul ensues or goes through is because of what they themselves created. And God provides hell as a way to cleanse the soul so they get another chance later. So when we feel the pain of our karma, the first place we look for a blame for that pain must be within. Not to blame the one who delivers the karma to us, because the one who gives us the karma is an angel. The one who gives us the pain is divine. We don't grasp that because of the nature of our animal mind. Any other questions? In Spanish, uh, the priests are called curas, which means healers. Mm. Yeah, the comments made that in Spanish, the word for priest is healer, cura. In reality, throughout the ancient times in all the different traditions, the priests were always the healers, the shaman, the one who heals the, the village or the tribe or the group. And this is still true in Tibetan medicine and most traditional forms of medicine, that to be a doctor, you must be a priest. And to be a priest, you must be a doctor. And even Paracelsus said as much. Um, you said earlier um, that Gnosis was medicine uh, to the soul and poison to the ego. Now, when one you know, uh, puts Gnosis into practice, will it become easier uh, for that person's life, but at the same time more difficult, more difficult because of the ego and more easier because of the consciousness being awakened and being expanded? Yes, it becomes both easier and more difficult. And it's easy to understand if you imagine yourself right now <clears throat> and you try to unzip yourself in half. It won't feel good. It's painful. That's what we have to do. We have to extract the consciousness from its prison. But this isn't a prison like a simple cage with a door. It's a prison of flesh which feels. And that prison of flesh is not physical. It's matter in the fifth dimension, specifically related with the mind and the heart. We believe we are the ego. We feel ourselves in the ego. What we feel is mostly because of that, because our consciousness is asleep. When we learn this teaching, we hear we have to die psychologically. This sounds like an interesting theory. The practice of it is unpleasant. Medicine is bitter. It hurts. It's painful. But through that pain, through the real application of Gnosis, the consumption of that extreme unction, the medicine, even though the pain is there and the difficulties and the frustration and the ordeals, we start to taste the freedom of the soul. This is something inexpressible. It reminds me of a conversation about something related to this, where a, a person asked, what's the real difference between the black magician who has ambition for power and the white magician who has ambition to enter the absolute? Because to us, it seems the same. They seem to both want to ascend somewhere, to have desire, to acquire something. But there is a very potent and important difference between these two. The one who craves power, whether it's physical power, sexual power, economic power, or power in the fifth dimension, to dominate others, or to walk through walls or to show their powers or make diamonds or whatever it is. These are desires rooted in self, rooted in ego. The person who practices Gnosis, who really works to free the ego or free the consciousness from the ego, begins to taste that freedom. That is what we call Eden. 
bliss. When you feel what it's like to be outside of the cage, you want to stay outside of the cage. You want to be free of pain, free of suffering. This is not a desire. This is a longing. This is our right. So the, the angel or the initiate who is ascending the many levels back towards the absolute is not seeking to become something more. He's seeking to become something less. To become no I. To become pure of I. There is individuality there. There's what we call a solar personality. And that's the personality of the real being, which is pure intelligence, bina, pure wisdom, hokma. This is the, the intelligence or the individuality within prana, which is emptiness. This is inconceivable to us. The person, the initiate who has tasted that, the nature of the void, has tasted the nature of Christ which has no individuality, the way we understand it. So the white magician longs to be lost in that light, to merge into that ocean. Our ego hates that idea because we want to be an individual. We want to stand apart. We want to be different. We want to be recognized, noticed. This is not how it is in the heavenly realms. If you're seeking to be noticed, to be different, to stand out, this is ego. This is what they want in Klee Pop. In the book of Acts, when the Peter and John are performing the extra uh, extravagance, uh, Simon the Magician is asking for the same power. So, is that extravagance performed by the Holy Spirit? Yeah, in the book of Acts, the apostles are performing the extreme unction to heal. Simon, the magician, wants that power, and he tries to buy it. The point is, who is it that's performing the miracle? Is it the apostle? Is it a power that can be bought or sold? No. The only one who can be given that power is given it by God because they've earned it, because they're pure enough, clean enough, righteous enough, virtuous enough to receive it. This is why in uh, Logos Mantra Theurgy, Samael and Vior explains the story about a healing that was performed. And the, the Gnostic priest received a payment, a financial payment for that. And then the Holy Spirit came to that priest and said, you're doing very badly. So the priest then knew he had to return the money because he didn't do anything. The one who did the healing was the Holy Spirit, God. <clears throat> That's why we offer these teachings freely. That's why all real knowledge is free, at least from the filth of money. We do pay for it, but not terrestrially, because everything costs something. So when we encounter spiritual teachers who charge enormous money for their teachings or they charge money for healings, they're doing something wrong. The real one who heals is God. And the real one who teaches is God. That's why in the book of Revelation, we heard the angel say, do not bow before me. I'm your brother. Worship God. Unfortunately, we find many so-called apostles, prophets, masters who want to be worshipped who want everybody to recognize them and say, yes, we see that you are master so-and-so. 
This has nothing to do with Christ. Christ gives freely of himself and asks nothing in return. Jesus beautifully represented that in the most profound act of extreme unction ever seen when he died on the cross. He gave everything for others. And even when they were persecuting him, punishing him, whipping him, spitting on him, he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. He didn't say, hey, I'm Jesus. You shouldn't do this to me. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What would you say to guys listening to this stuff? Uh, like, some of this sounds like a scare tactic in terms of the catastrophe that we always talk about, right? Like the external catastrophes. You know? What differentiates us from any other group that attracts souls by catastrophe? And to me, it sounds like reality, capacity has to be within oneself, you know, in order to feel that, you know. If you go to the doctor, and the doctor tells you you have cancer and you have two weeks to live, would you accuse him of scare tactics? Or would you be glad he told you the truth? That's just it. A lot of people would get mad at the doctor and leave. I'm going to go get another opinion. The key thing there is that the doctor may not know exactly how long you have to live, but the doctor is skilled and educated to know that you have cancer and that it's killing you. The difference with this teaching, the teaching of Samael and Vior, is that, yes, we teach that humanity is facing the end of this cycle that this race will die and that everything that exists on this planet will cease to be. This is a fact and anyone who awakens consciousness can confirm that. The difference, because there are other groups that teach similar things. You always hear prophecies, the world's going to end in 2012, the Mayan calendar and all these different theories that you hear about. But the difference is that through the Gnostic Church, you can learn how to come out the other side. To not just be a victim, but to conquer. Part of what we teach in Gnosis is that in the midst of the greatest adversity is the greatest potential for change. And this is a key in Buddhism as well. This is why the the higher teachings, those that really grasp the depths of the knowledge, teach you that peaceful moments in life are poison for the consciousness in these times to to have this sort of to escape from reality to go hide in the woods is actually bad for you and that's because right now there is a proliferation of knowledge such that have never been seen there's more knowledge available publicly and for free than there ever has been ever We now have access to the root texts of every tradition. The secret doctrine in every tradition is revealed. And this is because the Gnostic Church is performing extreme unction for this humanity. The spiritual knowledge is the balm that we need in order to save the soul before the body dies. That's the difference. Can we state that uh, Buddhism, since it's related with the Messiah, Mayan, is a doctrine for extreme action in this uh, moment for the end? Absolutely. I would agree with that. Buddhism definitely is a very direct medicine for the mind. It is a form of extreme unction, specifically focused on the mind, on Netzach. And I believe that this is why Samael and Vior made such an emphasis of the union between Buddhism and Christianity and stated directly that after his resurrection, he would go to Asia in order to unify 
Buddhism and Christianity. But Asia is Asya, the physical world. And Samael, through his doctrine, is unifying Buddhism and Christianity through the masters and servants of the Gnostic Church. And this is why we're seeing now such great availability of texts and teachings from Buddhism that for the last few thousand years have been hidden. This is because we need this balm for the mind. We need the doctrines of Christ and Buddha to work together in us. So it is extremely important for students and instructors of the Gnostic tradition to deeply study Buddhism in conjunction with Christianity, side by side. Christianity, the esoteric Christianity that we study in the Peace de Sophia and other important texts relates directly with the path of the Bodhisattva, especially in the higher levels. But to reach that, we need to create the solar mind and we need to cleanse our mind, our lunar mind. So we need that extreme unction. Can we then state that uh, the best medicine of extreme unction at this very moment is meditation? Yeah. So the various forms of the knowledge that we receive, we've discussed before. We discussed the three chambers. And in the first chamber, our primary interest is in the intellectual study. When we enter the other chambers, we enter into aspects of the teaching that relate to the other brains, the emotional brain and the motor instinctive sexual brain, to go very deep into working in those aspects of our psyche. Nonetheless, even at the very beginning of enter this teaching, we need to learn to meditate. Meditation specifically is related with the priesthood of Netza, hermetic magic. We know meditation techniques that relate to the other spheres. We know meditation techniques that relate to Malkut, specifically the physical body. Many of these techniques are taught and, and uh, proliferated by the Shravakayana schools or foundational level schools called insight schools, Zen, forms of sutrayana or, or Buddhist teachings. These are introductory levels of meditation and preliminary concentration, often with relaxation or insight as the goal. We know there are meditation techniques related to yasod, related to the vital body. There are a whole variety of techniques contained in these schools related to the vital body. There are meditation techniques related with the astral body, with the emotion. And we teach all of these in Gnosis. However, the critical one, the pinnacle, the most important, is really with Netza, the mind. This practice to learn to manage the mind is the most direct way for us to comprehend extreme unction. We receive the doctrine intellectually, in Malkut, we begin to transmute our sexual energies and work with the priesthood of Yasod through sexual magic. We begin to learn ceremonial or ritualistic magic in Hod and through the development of devotion, Bhakti. But the real work, the heart and soul of it, of the cure, is in Etza, in the mind, meditation. If we avoid that, we will die because the medicine won't be applied. The medicine we need comes through meditation. That medicine is comprehension, real insight, vipassana, which means special insight in Sanskrit. This means it's an insight beyond the comprehension we can receive through the lower forms of meditation, which includes self-observation. Through the physical senses, you can only see what is physical. And you can only see some of the symptoms of what is more subtle than that. 
from the fifth dimension specifically. To get at the root of the illness, you must see the illness where it comes from. That illness is deep in the mind. Those 49 levels of the mind. And the way you get there is through meditation. There's no other way. Meditation is the very basis, the very foundation, the very heart of the cure we need. We can transmute all the energy we want. If we don't meditate, there's no cure. Yes? What would your recommendation be for a new student in terms of meditation? For a new student to learn about meditation, the first thing that I would recommend is to study the teachings through the intellect in a balanced way. You have to study the teachings and then contemplate what you study. Not just stuff the mind with concepts, but read a little bit and then sit back and relax and think about it. Contemplate it. Look how it applies to your life and what you've experienced. Go further than that. Close your eyes and relax and keep contemplating, relaxing, and looking into what you've studied. This is a basic form of meditation and can lead you to a lot of understanding. The lectures that we give here come from our own comprehension of what we've studied, not merely in the books of Samael and Vior or the scriptures, but through our own life. Gnosis is born out of practical knowledge. It means practical knowledge. But that comes through our own individual effort. If we're just reading things and believing them, we're not gaining much. A belief cannot change our situation. Real, deep understanding can. So a beginner can start there and complement that with transmutation, with chanting mantras, learning how to relax, learning how to self-observe and self-remember. All those things are important. Little by little, that student needs to cultivate the discipline and the understanding of what meditation is, not by force and not in a militaristic way. Gradually, by experience. And I say it that way specifically for an important reason. When we hear this teaching and, our, and w the emphasis we place on meditation, some people react to that by saying, new student, now I'm going to meditate for an hour or two hours every day. It's a great intention, but nobody manages to do it. They may do it for a few days, but then they get burned out and they quit. What's better is to start small. Be realistic. Spend a few minutes each day relaxing and practicing a technique. And gradually, as you gain experience from that and you gather the importance of it and you start to see how important and necessary it is and how much it nourishes you, you will gradually and naturally increase the amount you meditate. Naturally. So don't make it like a big chore that you feel is a burden because you'll poison your own development. Start slow and where you are. Listen to your guidance that you get from inside. Your being knows what you need and will guide you in your practices if you listen. <coughs> there are hundreds of techniques in this tradition. Any one of them can be useful for you at the right time. And this is part of why we don't have a rigid code that every student has to follow, because every student is in a different place. You'd be like a doctor who says, every patient who comes in has to take this pill, and then this pill, and then this pill. That makes no sense. A doctor has to come in. A doctor has to look at each patient and say, you have this illness, you have this problem, this is the medication that you need. Each patient has their own needs. So each of us is a patient. But each of us is our own doctor. We have to become our own doctor. The real physician in us is our being who's inside. And if we listen to the guidance we get through dreams, through meditation, through intuition, we can say, oh, you know what? I'm feeling attracted towards this particular meditation or towards this particular book or towards this mantra. Listen to that. That subtle attraction, that subtle interest is the guidance that you're looking for. 
Don't just start reasoning, oh, no, I'm not ready, or oh, no, no, that sounds too hard, or oh, no, so-and-so said not to do that. Listen inside, not outside. So individual meditation is different than a group meditation. Right. Individual meditation is different from group meditation. Both have value. Both are important. Both are recommended. If you have access to a Gnostic school, go as much as you can and meditate. It will help you. Because the group energy is very, very strong and can help you a lot. But more specifically, if you've got other students there who have some experience, they can help you. Not only by their presence, but by their knowledge. This is very important. More questions? Sure. Okay. Hermetic magic comes from the tradition of Hermes Trismegistus, who is a great master from past ages that we know in relation with Egypt and Greece. Hermes, in, in uh, its root connotation, is related with Mercury. It's another name for Mercury. And Mercury is related with the mind, with air. So when we talk about hermetic magic, the real meaning is magic in relation with the mind, with the forces of the air. That's all. More questions? Okay, thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.